meeting here at Milton Baptist Church. Uh, just to say that we will be meeting in person again this coming Sunday morning, the 6th of December at 9.30 and 11 a.m. And of course, we look forward to renewing fellowship one with another face to face. And uh, we certainly missed you and missed each other these last four weeks of lockdown. But tonight, we are back in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44. And we're going to pick up our reading where we left off last Wednesday evening at verse 9 of this chapter. And we're going to read down to verse 23, Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 9. It says, they that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed. And the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yea, they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his room, he marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He heweth it down cedars, and he taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengthened for himself among the trees of the forest, he planted in ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burnt part of it in the fire. Yea, also hath baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it, and I shall make the residue thereof an abomination. Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. And we trust the Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word. Few of us in this country have really been exposed to what might be described as wholesale idolatry, such as that which the Bible speaks of. We can hardly imagine growing up in such a place or living in such a place where you are completely surrounded and your life is governed by idols. And yet with all, we know that that was the situation in the ancient times, the ancient Athens, for example. It was said that you were more likely to... Uh, meet a god than a man. There were more gods than there were men in the city. But here in the UK, our cities are largely free. 
of idols, and our churches are for the most part free of idols. And, uh, you know, you think about why that is. Well, obviously, that's as a consequence of our history, of the Reformation, of our Protestant heritage. But elsewhere in the world, idols are an everyday sight. <coughs> you know, I remember when we first moved to the Republic of Ireland, which at that time was a devoutly Roman Catholic, the sight of idols was an everyday thing. There were statues everywhere. There were statues of saints uh, outside churches. There were statues by the roadside. There were statues in homes. There were statues even in people's cars. None of that was unusual at all. You know, you would drive out into the more rural parts of Ireland. You'd be miles away from any uh, town of any size. And you would see what would appear to be a bus shelter. And when I first saw this, I thought, that's a curious place to put a bus stop and a bus shelter out here in the wilds of nowhere. What a remarkable thing that there would be a bus service with such regularity that it would require a shelter such as this. And yet when I got up close, it wasn't a bus shelter at all, but was a cover for the statue of Mary. And I used to joke with my children, and as I pastored there, as we would drive by such places, I would say to my kids, look, there's poor Mary, and she's still waiting for a bus. And you might think that to have been disrespectful of me, or sacrilegious perhaps, but remember that Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 4 that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other God but one. And if you think I have a reprehensible view of idols and idolatry, and if you think that I'm being rather sarcastic about these things, well, understand that God does far more so, that he exposes in this wonderful chapter the absurdity of idolatry. Whether we're speaking about a statue of a saint or some pagan deity such as Buddha or Brahma. Now last week we saw how in advance of their captivity in Babylon, God reached out to the people of Judah and he brought them a message of comfort and reminded them of his grace and told them that they had nothing to fear as long as they kept his person ever before them. And we read there in verse 6 some of the titles that the Lord ascribes to himself. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God, and who as I shall call and declare it, uh, for, and set an order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them, fear you not, neither be ye afraid, have I not told you from that time, and have declared it, you are even my witnesses, is is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God or no rock. I know not any. Look at those titles again. The Lord, the King of Israel, the, your Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the first and the last, the omniscient one, the rock of God's people. Now in sharp contrast to that revelation of God by himself, God now challenges the idols and idolatry that has won the hearts of the people of Judah, that has led them astray that has deceived their hearts according to verse 20 to where they cannot even tell a lie from the truth and God is going to challenge this idolatry and he wants it to be a lesson that they will take with them into Babylon when ultimately they are going to be judged now you must remember that the people of Judah ultimately descended into the worst excesses of idolatry. In fact, they even accessed the Holy of Holies, the very temple, heart of the temple of God, and erected idols in that place, in that holy place. And such folly could not possibly go unchallenged. So we find several truths here pertaining to idolatry from the divine perspective. And the first of these we see in verses 9 to 11. We see that idolatry is vanity and unprofitable. Notice the key terms in verse 9, and you should highlight them in your Bible. Notice the word vanity. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. The word means nothingness. 
So God says of idols, they are nothing. That's exactly what Paul says of idols in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul and Isaiah are in complete agreement. The making of an idol is a futile exercise, whether that idol is made in a Christian context, supposedly, or made in a pagan context. Notice the term, shall not profit there in verse 9. Their vanity, they shall not profit, and their delectable things shall not profit. The word delectable means precious things, those things which are desirable. You know, men elevate these idols to onto high places, idols of stone, idols of metal, idols of wood, and they bestow upon them uh, gifts of food and, uh, and flowers and, and other things, as, as if these feigned things could in any way reciprocate those offerings with any form of blessing. One might as well worship a brick as an ornamented, uh, as an ornamented that is fashioned out of stone. There, there's no gain in idol worship. There's nothing that those objects can do. They cannot avail for us. Then notice thirdly the phrase, be ashamed. The term means to be disappointed. An idol is a disappointment because it can never live up to its billing. It can never live up to its promise. The object is presented to us as a deified form of some kind, as divine in some sense, as possessing the attribute of holiness in some way. And yet with all, the Bible says they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor they, do they nor know that they may be ashamed. An idol is, is absolutely unresponsive. It's inanimate. I don't in whatever its form is always going to be a letdown to the idol worshiper. So when Isaiah says they are their own witnesses, he's stating even that the idol worshippers are witnesses to their own folly and to the complete failure of their own particular form of religion. Now you think that they would readily see that. You know, that's one of the arguments that is made here in verse 19 when he goes on to talk about the variety of ways in which the materials that make an idol may be used. And, he, and, and the point is that you think that they would see it. You think that the, the person who makes these things would come to a realization that the same material that lit his fire, that baked his bread, that cooked his dinner, is exactly the same material that he has sitting on his mantle as a god. And he would deduce that he was waiting wasting his time in worshiping such a thing. But of course, this is a deception of the heart. So question 10, or a question is asked in verse 10, who hath formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? God says, who is producing these things? Whoever it is, well, they shall be brought to shame. Notice verse 11, Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yea, they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. He calls them into his court. Let them stand up. Let them give an account of themselves. Let them tell me what's on their heart and on their mind. Let them show me their logic, their reason. Let me see what was going through their heads when they thought that somehow or other they could take the Almighty and contain him in an article of wood or of metal or of stone or some other material. How could they possibly, as, as children of Israel, have turned away from the Lord, their King, their Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the first and the last, the omnipotent one, the rock of their salvation, and indeed seek to construe him as some grotesque image, some very poor shadow of the truth? So we think now about the production of these religious relics and artifacts and we wonder just how these things came to be that, that, uh, that, that we would think of them uh, as something spiritual. Uh, you know, where did they come from? And we're led back by the Spirit of God into the production process. And the Scripture points us back to the blacksmith and the carpenter and the, and the woodsman. And he shows us how these things are made. Notice that idolatry is, is the worship of man. Not only is idolatry vanity and unprofitable, it's actually a form of man. 
man worship. Verse 12, the smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it with a line. He fitteth it with planes. He marketh it out with the compass. He maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. You know, God made man in his image. And man makes idols in his image. That's what verse 12 and 13 is telling us. Here we see the smith, or the blacksmith, if you like, in his shop, sweating away by his great furnace, heating iron, beating iron upon his anvil, forming it into some image or other. And notice he worketh with the strength of his arm. That's the arm of flesh. He fashioneth it. He worketh it. That's what the verse says. You can see the picture in your mind's eye, can't you? You can see this man, uh, very hard at work, an industrious figure, Indeed, such is the level of his industry that he has neither time for food nor drink in the process of making this idol. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water and is faint. And you can't help but wonder, are, are those descriptions of the man's physical state not also in some way a, 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 an allegory uh, or analogy of his spiritual state? That in his spirit he is hungry, in his spirit he is thirsty, but he is never satisfied satisfied by the work of his hands. His heart need cannot be met by the image of a God. And then we're brought to the carpenter's shop. And you can almost envisage him hammering and sawing and planing and sanding and kneeling and gluing. His work is very precise. He stretches out his rule. He marks it with a line. He fits it with planes. He marks it out with a compass. I mean, this is a work of craft. This is a work of skill. He is shaping uh, this mold. And, and, and this, is the, this is the critical thing. He's shaping it, notice, after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, using the medium of wood. He's turning this thing into an object that is really made in his own image, after his own likeness. Now, of course, it may have some grotesque feature to it. It may have, you know, some elongated tongue or, or, or big eyes or, or something else that he dares to put upon it. But, of course, he's nonetheless working from that which is familiar so that the, <coughs> excuse me, so that the idol reflects its creator. You know, all idolatry and every idol is created after the image of man. Even in our own society, when you hear a person say something like this, well, a God of love would never send anyone to hell, you realize that you're listening to the word of a person who has created a God in their own image. That person is not now reflecting the God who reveals himself in Scripture, but a God of their own thinking, a God of their own mind, a God derived from their own thought life. Idols are conceived in the heart and mind long before they are crafted in wood or metal. And notice that the purpose of this carpenter's work is to make something for his own home that it may remain in his house, says verse 13 at the end. You know, an idol, for all of its crafted beauty, is at the end of the day still just an idol. It's just an object. It's just an ornament of sorts. In Jeremiah chapter 10, the prophet paints a, a, another picture or a similar picture uh, of the uh, carpenter at work. When he says in verses 4 and 5 of that chapter, speaking of the idol that they're crafting, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fastened it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They're upright. These idols is the palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So idolatry is the worship of a man. And idolatry uses, ironically, the things of God to make an idol. 
Look at verse 14. The carpenter, as a woodsman, goes out. He heweth him down cedars. He cuts down cedar trees. He takes the cypress and the oak tree, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Notice, here are trees and rain to water the trees. God takes us one step further back in the production line, and he brings us to the forest, where now the carpenter goes out as a woodsman, choosing and cutting down a tree of his own liking. You know, at this time of year, many people will be visiting Christmas tree farms, and you'll see them walking up and down lines, trying to pick the tree that is most suitable for their home and the one that they think is the perfect shape or the right kind of needles or whatever kind of thing that attracts them to that tree. Well, that's a similar type of idea here. This man is going through the forest. He's looking for a particular tree. He's looking for a particular type of wood. He's looking for a, typical, a particular age, a, a particular size of tree. And the irony is that the one who made the tree the one who gave life to the tree, the one who enabled growth to the tree, and who in his goodness sent rain upon it, is completely ignored in this, in this process. It rather reminds me of the story of a scientist who approached God and said to him, God, we don't need you anymore. Science has finally figured out everything. We finally figured out a way to create life out of nothing. We can now do what you did in the beginning. Oh, is that so? Replies God. Yes, says the scientist. We can take dirt and form a human likeness and breathe life into it, thus creating a man. Well, it's very interesting, God said. Show me. So the scientist reaches down, he grabs a handful of soil from the earth, and he starts to mold that dirt into the shape of a man. And just then God intervenes and he says, no, 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 get your own dirt. And you see, you see the irony in it is that here are these scientists who are working with everything that God created and yet at the same time denying the God who created it whilst patting themselves on their back for their own ingenuity. And yet with all the same was true of idol worshippers who created objects that came from the creation of God in the first place and were used to ignore the creator at the heart of them. Then idolatry doesn't just use the things of God to make the idol, but idolatry serves men rather than God. Look at verse 15. Then it shall be for a man to burn, that is the wood. He shall take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and breaketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, and with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth, roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and saith, Aha, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the residue, the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. Here we find a man having now found his suitable tree, cuts it down, but of course, you know, having cut the tree down, he has more tree than he has need for in respect to the creation of an idol. And so he brings the wood home and he puts it to a variety of uses. Some of it is used for heating his home. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. Some of it will be used for baking bread. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Some of it will be used for cooking. He burneth part thereof in the fire. And with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. But then what is left, or what, sorry, with what is left, he makes his idol. Verse 17, and the residue thereof he maketh a god. For the same wood which was used to heat his home, the same wood that was used to bake his bread, 
The same wood that was used to heat his roast is now employed in the construction of a god, a god that is to be fallen before and worshipped and venerated as divine. You know, it's really a laughable thing. Verse 19 points it out. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Ye have also baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. Shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? Look how pathetic his cry is in verse 17. Deliver me, for thou art my God. Now, you see, the whole matter of true worship has been placed on its head. The wood is serving the man. The wood served the man to heat his home. The wood served the man to bake his bread. The wood served the man to roast his roast. And now the wood is serving the man to be his God. And he's calling upon this lump of wood to serve him who made it. In other words, idolatry serves men rather than God. The idol becomes the servant of its creator. And then we find idolatry is, according to verses 18 and 19, ignorant and irrational. They have not known nor understood, for they shut their eyes they cannot see, and their hearts they cannot understand. None understandeth in his heart. We just read this. Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned part of it in the fire, and so on. This man just doesn't seem to understand the error of his ways. He can't figure out that the thing he is worshipping is the same thing he's just burned for warmth and used for cooking. Notice how God demeans his efforts at the verse 19, at the very tail end of this verse. He refers to his idol as simply the stock of a tree. He says, let's look at yourself. You're worshipping a tree stump. You're worshipping a branch. You're worshipping a piece of tree, a lump of wood, nothing more, nothing less. Perhaps the best commentary in this is in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, where Paul is he's introducing this wonderful book that speaks of our justification by faith. It says this of, of the natural man, because that when they knew not God, verse 21 of chapter 1, because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. In the words of one commentator, the idol worshipper misses the goal for which humanity was made. And his own delusion, the delusion that the creature and the creator are the same, is the cause of that failure. Why would we not see the fallacies of the delusion? Why would we not ask the obvious questions that idolatry raises? Because the biblical alternative is too painful. We would rather believe that we can capture the divine in the stuff of this world with all the contradictions that involves, than to admit that God is utterly beyond our control and manipulation. And there's the truth of it. When you have an idol, that idol is in your hands. That God is in your hands. His destiny is in your hands. You can move him wherever you want to place him. You can put him out the door and replace him with another if you grow weary of him. You can say anything you like to him, for he cannot hear. You can do whatever you want because he cannot respond. You, you're the one who's in control. You're the decision maker. But the moment you despair, of idolatry and relate to the true God, now you're dealing with one who is in control and who cannot be manipulated by man. Then notice idolatry leads to a perverted appetite. Verse 20. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? What are ashes? Well, ashes is all that is left of matter 
after it has been completely consumed by fire. Ashes pictures for us death and ruination. You know, at a funeral, uh, at a graveside, we often do a committal, which involves the, the line, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's saying to us that we've come to the end, that we've finally been caught up by the curse, that our life has been now consumed by our own sinful nature. You know, our young people would probably not remember the pleasure of a real cold fire and getting up on a cold winter's morning at December or January morning and the first duty of the day to be taking out the ashes that lay in the hearth and to dispose of them and going out into a windy morning and having those uh, little dust particles blowing into your face and, and it was just wasn't very pleasant of all, at all. But ashes represents the vanity of it all. Nothingness. The whole practice of it is absurd and, and feign. And yet it was these very things that would ultimately lead the nation of Judah into Babylonian captivity. These people who should have done better would sell their souls to idolatry and give themselves to pagan gods and the gods of their own imagination. So in the light of who he is, in verses 6 to 8, and all that he has done, and in the light of what idols are and what they cannot do, their impotence, the Spirit calls upon the readers of Isaiah's prophecy to do three things. To remember, to return, and to rejoice. Look in verse 21. To remember. He says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Remember these, O Jacob. When you're carried away into a strange land, when you're chastened and chastised, when you're being punished by Nebuchadnezzar and his army, when you find yourself living in foreign surroundings and listening to a foreign tongue and you're wondering why you're there, remember these. Remember who is responsible for this state of affairs. Look back and see those lifeless forms that you worship that were helpless to deliver you. You made them, but I have formed thee. You serve them, but you are my servant. In essence, the Lord calls upon them to remember who they belong to exactly and be thankful that though they had forgotten him and would forget him, he has not and would not forget them. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Remember, he says. And then he says, return. I have blotted out, verse 22, as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. I have blotted out or wiped out, wiped away your sins. What a glorious truth. That is as true for you and for me as it was for the ancient believer of Judah. In Christ, our sins have been blotted out. Our slate has been wiped clean. We have been given a fresh start, a new beginning, a new opportunity. It is likened to a dark cloud that has been hanging over us, this terrible cloud of sin that God simply blows away and allows the sunshine of redemption to shine through. And again, that they're reminded that the Lord is their Redeemer, not idols of wood or iron. The Lord. And they're called upon to return to him. That is, to repent. In fact, that word return is imperative in the Hebrew language. It's the most important word in the whole sentence there. It involves turning in an opposite direction to the one that you're facing, to take a new route, to go a different way. In this case, it is to turn from the place of idolatry back to the true worship of the living God. Reminds me of the actions of the Thessalonian church. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 1, who had this wonderful testimony that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
The complete change is required here. In the words of Jeremiah and Lamentations 5 and 21, Turn thou as unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. God calls upon them to return. But of course, they did not return. And then he calls upon them to rejoice. Verse 23. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Psalm chapter 96, we read in just how the, the creation cries out in praise and in worship of the Lord. In verse 11, it says, Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, and the people with his truth. And here's the irony. The very creation the very wood of the trees that a man takes and employs in the, in the crafting of an idol, in making a god, is itself yearning for redemption. It is awaiting that day when Christ will come and restore the earth to its former glory. You see, man subjects creation to a position it does not belong in, the position of God. And all creation, even in its present fallen and sinful state, sings praise to God. And that's its purpose. And that's our purpose also. In truth, friends, the heartbeat of an idolater lives within us all. There's something within us that wants to revere other things beside God. Sometimes, you know, our God is gold. Our God is personal glory. You know, our God is sex. Our God is drugs or, or whatever you want to put in there. Sometimes people are driven by money and, and, and hollow pursuits. Sometimes we idolize other people. Maybe someone we know or maybe some distant figure like a movie star or a sports star or a pop idol. And yet the Bible warns us in the very last verse of John's first epistle, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Right there. We see that the apostles recognized that any one of us could succumb to the temptation to worship and revere something or someone other than the true God. And for that reason, all of us need to watch our hearts and extinguish the slightest flicker of idolatry should we find it within. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts tonight as we gather around the throne of grace and before the one true God. May indeed our hearts be encouraged to know that unlike idols, he can hear, he can see, and he can answer our prayers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity again just to hear your word and to study it together. Bless these thoughts, I pray, and use them for the edification of your people and our encouragement as we come into your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.